In November, with the British Army in hot pursuit, Washington abandoned Manhattan completely. But essentially, the goal was protect the army, don't protect the place. Very nearly uh, as the Vietnamese fought the United States in the Vietnam War. You're fighting a little country, fighting the leading military power in the world. The most important thing to do is keep the war going on. And sooner or later, this great power will tire of the effort and leave. And that's, in fact, what the British did. And I think that lesson was learned in New York in 1776. For seven long years, the Revolutionary War raged. New York was no longer a city, but a British garrison, the largest military base on Earth, home to a handful of patriots and more than 10,000 British troops and officers. Spurred on by British offers of emancipation, thousands of slaves from around the country poured into New York to free themselves in the war for American freedom. Blacks had to join the other side. Though the streets of Manhattan never saw fighting again, the destruction New Yorkers had for so long feared came anyway. On September 21st, 1776, four days after the British occupation began, a fire broke out near Whitehall Street. With the fire brigade gone off to war, the blaze moved north unchecked engulfing building after building, including the proud spire of Trinity Church, the tallest structure in town. The 140-foot-high wooden steeple, one man said, soon resembled a vast pyramid of fire. Before it was over, 500 buildings had been destroyed, and the entire western half of New York City lay in ruin. The British took over, Loyalists from everywhere flooded into New York City. New York was, in essence, a British stronghold throughout the entire war. It played, in that sense, no role in the American Revolution. The city couldn't claim to have been critical, except in so far as, as long as the British held it, this was a major headache for Washington. And at the very last minute, you know how important New York City was because when the French finally agreed to use their fleet to help Washington out, Washington rubbed his hands together and said, let's get New York. Little by little, the tide of battle turned. In 1778, the French entered the war on the American side, and Dutch businessmen loaned five million guilders to help the Patriot cause. Finally, the English capitulated completely. On November 25th, 1783, George Washington led his army triumphantly back into New York City. The British surrendered to the Americans inside the old fort at the foot of Manhattan, where Peter Stuyvesant had surrendered the Dutch colony to the British 119 years before. The Union Jack was lowered. The stars and stripes were raised. Crowds cheered and cannon boomed. New York was an American city at last, though no one yet knew precisely what that would mean. When New York's exiled citizens returned after seven years of war, they were shocked by what they found. The city lay in ruins. Thousands of families loyal to the English cause had fled forever. And the hulks of abandoned, half-ruined mansions were visible everywhere. No other American city had experienced anything like it. The American Revolution had a profound influence on the city of New York. First of all, the city burned. One reason we don't think of New York as so historic is because so little survives from the 17th or 18th century. And in a way, that's the kickoff point for the rise of New York City to be, in a way, the great metropolis of the world. It was there in the end of the American Revolution. It was small, it was depopulated, much of its leadership had left, very little was going on. And somehow, in the next half century, or less, 
this small trading post becomes the most important city in the Western Hemisphere. To an astonishing degree, the key to New York City's rise, and with it the rise of America itself to urban greatness, would lie in the hands of one man, the brilliant combative immigrant from the West Indies, Alexander Hamilton. No one in his own era disputed his genius. There were people who didn't like him. There were people who wished him dead and one who killed him. But no one disputed his genius. And the brightest of them understood exactly that this was a man to be feared. Not because of his personal power, but because of the vision that he had for the development of the country. Within days of the British surrender, Hamilton had joined the flood of New Yorkers returning to the city, bringing with him his wife and infant son. They settled in a house at 57 Wall Street, just down the street from his arch enemy and political rival, Aaron Burr. Within a matter of months, he had opened his own law firm, helped set up a society for the emancipation of slaves, then organized the city's first bank, the Bank of New York, which opened for business a few blocks away. In 1785, new neighbors arrived. The brand new Continental Congress, unable to decide on a permanent home, set up temporary headquarters in New York City, on Wall Street, right next door to the Hamiltons. In the years to come, Hamilton would do everything in his power to keep the capital in Manhattan, convinced the future of America lay not in the countryside, but in the city. He made what is essentially the ultimate urban argument that city air breathes free. It was his argument that people are freer, there's a greater exchange of ideas, there's more opportunity for men uh, to acquire wealth in a commercial urban universe. Most people don't realize New York was really the first capital of the United States. Indeed, if the United States were like every other major country in the world, it would have been the capital. New York was a very logical place for a national capital. It was easy to get to. It was relatively centrally located. Historians should never play the game of what if, but still it's hard not to wonder what New York City would have been like had it become the political capital as well as the commercial, financial, and, and creative capital of the country. At noon on April 30th, 1789, George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States in New York City from the balcony of the old city hall, which New Yorkers had optimistically renamed Federal Hall. The new president quickly brought in Thomas Jefferson to be Secretary of State, though the Virginian loathed New York, which he called a sewer filled with all the depravities of human nature. Alexander Hamilton, just 33, was named the nation's first Secretary of the Treasury. And though the appointment came through on a Saturday, he went right to work. From his new office in the Treasury Department on Broadway, a few steps from newly rebuilt Trinity Church, Hamilton began mapping out the blueprint for a new kind of nation, one based not on plantations and slave labor, but on commerce, manufacturing, and immigrant toil. To a startling degree, he was mapping out the future of New York. Look at what he understood in a country that was 90% agrarian. Here's a man who understood that the future of the country was in manufacturing. Here's a man who understood what banking could do to develop the economy of the country. How you could use tax money from the many, put it in the hands of the few, and produce, as a result, a manufacturing revolution, the beginnings of industrialization in a country that was, what, two decades old. Southern planters immediately rose up in opposition to Hamilton's program. The mobs of great cities, Jefferson warned, add just so much to the support of pure government as sores do to the strength of the human body. Certain the nation's future lay not in the city, but in the countryside, Jefferson insisted the capital be moved out of New York to a rural setting just across the Potomac from his native Virginia. It was the beginning of a fateful split in American life. 
one that would pit South against North, country against city, and lead ultimately to civil war. Jefferson had this vision of the country being an agrarian country full of yeoman farmers. It was a vision that never existed even in his time, um, certainly not as he would have liked to have seen it. Um, but he loved that vision and he hated all things commercial. Hamilton loved commerce, he understood money, banking and money and flow of power through the economy. Unlike Jefferson, who never understood money at all, and which may account for why he was born one of the richest people in the colonies and died deeply, deeply in debt. Already, this split between a commercial manufacturing society and an agrarian staple crop based society between dynamic capital and capital that was invested in property and slaves and not as manipulable. These splits were already evolving given Hamilton's programs for the new nation. In the spring of 1790, the debate over the capital came to a fateful climax over another volatile issue, crucial to the success of Hamilton's economic programs. There was at that time a major issue dividing the, the new nation, and that is the debt incurred during the Revolutionary War by the respective colonies at that time. Some had not incurred much, others such as Virginia had paid theirs off. New York had the most. Well, New York should have had the most, it's where the most important fighting took place. Hamilton had one idea for the new nation, which is take up all that debt and have the federal government say, we'll pay for it. You incurred this debt honorably, you, in the aftermath, we have a national government, the national government will pay that debt for you, don't you worry. But once again, Southerners were adamantly opposed to Hamilton's vision, reluctant to pay off Northern debts and fearful of increasing Northern power. With Congress hopelessly deadlocked, it was now an open question, one congressman warned, whether this government is to exist for the ages or be dispersed among contending winds. On the evening of June 20th, 1790, with the government hovering on the brink of bankruptcy, Hamilton went to Jefferson's house on Maiden Lane, hoping to find some way out of the crisis. He said to Jefferson on that fateful meeting, we have to assume the Revolutionary War debt. Jefferson made a fateful offer. He said, all right, we'll do it. If you move the capital of this new nation from its natural site in Manhattan to a swamp on the banks of the Potomac, which turns malarial in April, such that any congressman who stays around till May will never get back. Uh, and uh, what could uh, Hamilton do? He um, accepted it. He was smart enough to know that wherever the government was located, if it was pursuing the kind of aggressive developmental programs that he wanted it to pursue, that he was going to win in the long run. It was more important what the government did than where the government did it, was a Hamilton's view. And ever since, one of the defining characteristics of the United States has been that the political capital was in one place, and the cultural, economic, intellectual capital was in another place, because that never left New York. 